we're live. We are live on Facebook. I'm going to pull it up on my phone. It's not real until I can see it. Hello, everyone. Hello to those. Hey, everyone. We have a big group today. Kind Morning. of wondering if most people are just on here. <laughs> we get, I know. We got so many people. <laughs> yes. Let's see. Why doesn't it show up for me in my notifications? Can y'all see it? Yeah, I'm on right now. Okay. Cool. I don't see it yet either. There it is. Can you see my guide comment? Can y'all see it? There's me. Okay. I can't see the guide comment yet. I don't have a guide comment. Oh, there it is. I don't see it, but I can't ever see. Oh, there it is. Yeah, never mind. Okay, so hello to everybody watching, everyone signing on. As you there can see, is. we've got a big, but I can't ever see it. Nice group. Someone's turning down their volume on their phone. <laughs> I was like, wait, where's that coming from? Okay, so as people are signing on, uh, just want to say welcome. Welcome to our leaders. Thanks for being in Zoom with us today. It's good to see your faces and it's good to see everyone in the comments. So stay active. We are um, going to ask you to go get your communion elements if you have not brought those with you. What do y'all have? What, what, what do y'all have going on here in the Zoom room? What is that, David? Is that a goldfish? Oh, it's cracker. <laughs> like a live. So I'm alive. <laughs> okay, let's see. What are, what is that, Jet? Is that a uh, nut? It is, they are butter rum glazed macadamia nuts from Hawaii because I was there recently. Ooh, <laughs> what? that sounds amazing. Wait, we've got Eva there with Tiffany with a cheese stick. And Tiffany, what is that? Is that a lime? Are you are taking? <laughs> Yeah, tequila shot. Shot. <laughs> uh, Forrest has a Waterloo and a cracker. Fran has something. Chocolate? It it's a square of chocolate. Ooh, nice. What do you have, Tracy? Is that a raspberry? Raspberry. And John, Matt has a nut. Jonathan, tea. I've got throat coat tea. <laughs> I love seeing, oh, a throat coat tea is my favorite. When everyone during the pandemic was like hoarding toilet paper, I went to the store and bought like five boxes of throat coat tea. Um, <laughs> it just tastes good. Uh, Peyton, what do you got going? Oh, I like your mug. Cute. Well, I have a half eaten um, breakfast taco. And then Lyle, look what Lyle brought me in, in bed this morning. <laughs> Super dad. So that's my problem. <laughs> okay, we've got a good group. How you are to have him. Yes, Paul said such a large group of leaders this AM. I don't know Jet, but good to see everyone. You're about to know Jet in a deeper look in just a mm -hmm. little bit. So we're really excited for y'all. Y'all, this is week one of our fall kickoff, fall stuff, fall series. Um, we're going to start with our week one of our post church church sermon series Fran's preaching so excited for y'all to hear that um the link is pinned in the comments so let us know if you can't see it but otherwise you can follow along in the guide that way and uh we are going to be some of us meeting tonight at Lark and Owl actually at like 4 p.m um there's a oh this book we're going to do this book club in the fall so Fran's doing links, but also sign up on our email list because that's truly the best way to get this information. Um, you can sign up for the book club or you can meet us at Lark and Owl at four to buy a copy. There's a book signing there today. We're going to probably grab a drink from their bistro outside. So feel free to join us at Lark and Owl. Temple says hi. Hi to Temple. Hi, Tracy. Temple said hi, Tracy. Sorry, Tracy, <laughs> would you like to respond? Specifically. <laughs> I did. We're, we're on it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dimple. Hi, Dimple. <laughs> um, so that's our big thing happening today. And then we also want to remind you to check out our Metamorphosis cohort application. We're really excited about that group. And I think there will be a link in the comments. You can check it out. It's a really thoughtful application process so that we can um, kind of like curate the perfect group of people who are you know, needing this space right now. And we're excited to do this in the future as well. Um, super excited. Matt, Fran, and I are creating the whole curriculum ourselves. And so based on what we wish we would have been able to talk about during, you know, decades of deconstruction <laughs> wow. and, re and reimagining faith. So check that out. Am I forgetting anything, Fran? 
I oh well the the kid led services next week we've got a fun a fun service planned that all of the kids are doing all the leadership of the of the service so of our gathering so it's going to be fun yes please uh so we all know and we'll put this out in, in print so you don't have to miss this but we have decided to keep that service online um this will be our last online service that was supposed to be an in-person service we're going to stream from the texas hall um there's just a lot of moving pieces with it being kids leading everything so we're going to stream it online for you and then after that you can expect our in-person dates to stay in person um it'll be cooler and cooler by then so we'll be able to just meet outside if things are crazy so we do intend on keeping our in-person dates after this month just fyi uh let's see and then i was going to say um, Anna, hi to Anna. She asked a good question earlier this week and I forgot to respond, but Lark and Owl should have copies of these. They had a shipping delay, but they should be there now. So if you're hoping to get a book um, over there, you should be able to get one. Um, okay, I'm gonna pass it off to Matthew who's who's on today. We hope uh, you're, you're okay over there, Matt. Why don't you give us an update? Yeah, I just wanted to say hi to everybody. Um, it's really good to see your faces and see the comments on Facebook. Um, I was in the middle or I was toward the end of doing my annual three weeks of military duty when I got a call and they said, you're going to New Jersey to support the Afghan withdrawal mission. Um, and so I'm up here doing that. It's, it's actually up in the air still as to how long I'm gonna be here, um, but it's been really good work. Uh, I'm basically working with the only wing in the Air Force that has a unique capability where they go out, they create an airfield somewhere, they operate it, and then they shut it down and come back home. And so these are the folks that had to go to Kabul and actually get the airport functioning, operate it for two weeks or so. You know, they're used to maybe getting and handling 40 planes a day, and they were handling over 100 planes a day. I mean, they're incredible biggest airlift in US history, 124,000 people. And then they and then they came back home um, last week. So it was I'm incredibly fortunate to get to work with with these folks who do incredible work in the world. Um, by way of like what I'm bringing to the fight and some of the assessments that I'm doing wearing my hat as pastor and chaplain, um, I'm attending to um, a lot of what you might think of as, as moral injury issues, um, having, having witnessed some difficult things. So taking care of, of counseling with them, being there for them, helping them kind of get re reoriented to this new world that they live in. Um, also, one of my roles here is to help with what's called religious accommodation requests. So we have a lot of well, let me back up a step. So the military has mandated that everybody has to get a vaccine and, and, and there are people who for religious reasons say they don't want to do that. And so that gets funneled uh, through me and I'm, I'm working with the troops on that stuff as well. A lot going on. I'm glad I could be here today. Any thoughts or questions to any of that? I'm, I'm glad to be here though. Thank you, Matt, for sharing. Um, we definitely miss you. We miss your presence. We're sorry you're kind of going it alone up there, but we also know you're doing really important work that is probably fulfilling for, for you right now as well. So that's good. And we support you from afar. Let us know if you need anything. Um, we're excited that you can join us though. Um, yeah, but and, and I have to take this opportunity to say thanks to everybody who's taking care of Heather and the kids. I mean, you all are doing amazing at checking up on her, doing practical things, whatever. Just thank you for being our community that holds us. Of course, and hopefully that's just the kind of community we are. So of course, everyone watching who's a part of our community um, who is interested, just know like we wanna support you and help you. All you have to do is you know, ask for what you need. Um, so thank you, Matt. I'm going to put it to speaker mode so that we can chime the hour, have a centering moment as we enter into this space. Uh, just know we're so glad you are here with us this morning and use this opportunity to have a grounding moment.
Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Tiffany, and this is Eva. And we get to uh, help with the children's uh, children sermon today. So if all the kids will come close. We are going to be reading a really awesome book today. It's called What is God Like? And it's by Rachel Held Evans and Matthew Paul Turner. So um, I don't know about you guys, but that sounds pretty cool. I'd love to know more about what God is like. Okay, so what is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world have wondered about since the beginning of time. And while nobody has seen all of God because God is far too big for any of us to fully see, we can know what God is like. God is like an eagle, sharp-eyed and swift with wings so wide you can play under their shadows. God is like a river, constant and life-giving. When you grow near God, you'll sprout up strong as a tree. God is like the stars, forever present and bright. Even when they feel far away, you can always look up and see them winking at you. God is like a shepherd, brave and good, a protector who loves her sheep so much that she watches over all of them and knows each of their names by heart. God is like a fort, strong and secure with walls that are mighty and safe. Inside, there are hidden places to hold you when you're scared or need a quiet place to rest. God is like a gardener, patient and nurturing. God plants, waters, weeds, and fertilizes the earth until every good thing on it seeks the nourishing sun and grows. God is like the flame of a candle, warm and inviting. With God close by, you can look to the light and see through the darkest of nights. God is like the wind, passionate and full of mystery. God is both here and mysteriously also over there. God is everywhere, swirling throughout the world, whistling across the mountain ranges, rustling through the trees, and pressing against your cheeks on a breezy day. God is like an artist, creative and unpredictable, always busy making and remaking everything brilliant and new. God is like a mother, strong and safe. You can crawl up in her lap whenever you want to, and she'll hold you until you fall asleep. God is like a father, gentle and safe. He'll put you on top of his shoulders to give you a bird's eye view of all of creation. God is like three dancers, graceful and precise. They move to the same music in very different ways, showcasing all of God's elegance and rhythm in your life. God is like a rainbow, vivid and full of co color, a dazzling reminder of promise and hope for all of people after a storm. God is like a best friend, faithful and true, closer to you than even your brothers and sisters. And because we know that God is what God is like, we know that God is kind, God is forgiving, God is slow to, be, to get angry. God is quick to be glad. God is happy when you tell the truth and sad when things are unfair. She is your protector. He is trustworthy. They are friends when you feel alone. God uh, hopes. God perseveres. What is God like? That's a very big question, one that people from places all around the world throughout all of time have answered in many different ways. Keep searching. Keep wondering. Keep learning about God. But whenever you aren't sure what God is like, think about what makes you feel safe, what makes you feel brave, and what makes you feel loved. That's what God is like. Thank you, guys. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Forrest, and um, I'm just going to mention this because it's relevant. So um, for anybody who knows about the Enneagram, I consider myself a nine wing five which means I don't know who I am or what I want, but I'm pretty sure there's a book out there that can tell me. So that'll be, that'll be kind of relevant. So uh, I was looking over the lectionary reading uh, for this week, and I saw James's message about the tongue and how, you know, such a warning about how much, how much damage we can do with our, with our, with our words. And, and, uh, and I was thinking about that, you know, in the context of my spiritual journey um, and how this relates to communion and um, for a long time, uh, for a very long time, I took the approach of trying to understand God basically only through the Bible, right? So I had read somewhere that 
John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, I think, um, said, you know, the Bible is the book of God. Like, if that's true, then why are we spending, wasting our time with anything else, right? And so I kind of adopted that posture uh, for a long time. Um, when I was in college, I, I read the, book, the Bible just over and over. One time I read it in like 90 days, 84 days, I think. And, uh, and I just found the notes from that, that, from that time. And, uh, and one of the things that, that was interesting, I thought, is as I, as I was flipping through my notes, I just kept saying, what does this mean? <laughs> what does this mean? What does this mean? And, um, and so that was around 2006, right? And so, um, so at the time, I think what I took away from James's message was, okay, so whenever you think someone's an idiot or you think someone's a jerk, just hold your tongue. Got it. Good talk, James. That's great. So that's where I was at, right? That was about 2006. <laughs> and um, so fast forward a few years to 2019. Uh, I was wandering in the spiritual desert for about 13 years. Could have been a lot worse, you know, right? We have some examples. So it uh, feels like a long time, but, you know, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be here now. So 2019, found peace of Christ. Uh, and that's when I was introduced to the concept of the Imago Dei, right? Where we are all like shards of God's image. I mean, that's, that's, that just was life-changing, right? And so, so it kind of shifted my entire being, right? And so I, I started to see people as the books of God, right? So, so the Bible is a book about God and it's like a biography and you can kind of get to know about someone. But if you, for my opinion, right, as like an avid reader, right? If you really want to know someone's heart, look at the books they're writing. What are they saying? What are they doing? And so people, right, are God's beating heart expressed out in the world. And so I learned to just see people that way, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that we're not a bunch of idiots and jerks, right? That we are masterpieces of God, of the living God who is love. And um, yeah, and just we're all, you know, we're all doing our best with what we have. And sometimes that's not enough. And sometimes it is. But, um, but I learned starting with myself, right, through the, through the inner work and seeking people's hearts, including my own, to just pour non-judgmental compassion into to that, right, to my heart, to everyone's heart. And that that's, that's what we need and that's who we are. And, um, and yeah, so, that, so that, that just changed everything for me. And so, um, yeah, and so, and so when you're seeking people's hearts, right, you, um, you can't help but stab them with the projections, with the trunks in your eyes that are your projections of your own wounds right and so you have to figure out what they are and find them out and 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 work on them and it's just such an amazing thing to be part of a community and, part, and be able to see and understand every living being in that way and so through that journey i just you know i'm just so grateful for this community and uh and so beautiful masterpieces of the god who is love can you please say the liturgy of communion with me now the lord be with you and also with you. Let's lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Lord, uh, I thank you so much for this community uh, of, of beautiful masterworks. Um, everybody here is your To Kill a Mockingbird, and I'm so grateful for every one of them. And uh, God, we just love you so much and, and just guide our hearts towards non-judgmental compassion for ourselves first so we can know what it looks like and feels like and send that out to each other and be joined with you in the work of reconciling everyone and everything into one family. Now, please eat and drink your elements. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ is the risen. Amen. All right. Good morning. It is my turn. Aurelia, I have no witty comments. Thank you. Uh, I do have an observation, and that is as we were saying the communion liturgy in the line where in our uh, written liturgies and things where it says it is right to give 
uh, oh no, it's where we lift we lift them to the Lord. My, uh, you know, 16 years in the Roman Catholic Church from birth to 16 says we lift them up to the Lord. And so when sometimes you'll hear me do that when we do this, and it's, I can't ever not say the up part. I don't know why. It's just that's what's written in there. And the other thing too, Aurelia, um, is that uh, like Matthew, I wanted to thank uh, the, the Peace of Tri Christ Church community for uh, the way that you took care of, of me and my family uh, in the last two to three weeks. Um, Hillary uh, got COVID and then uh, Riker, we assume, got COVID from her. And so Hillary was here in our room, Riker was in his room, and I was in the rest of the house with our girls. And uh, it was a very uh, trying a uh, week and a half, two weeks or so, but we got through it and, and part, large part uh, thanks to you all and the things that you did for us and helped us with. So thank you all so much. And now we will read um, our litany together. It is in the worship guide. If you scroll back up and find that, if you haven't done that already, uh, and the way this works, if you uh, are new with us or just as a reminder is that I'll read uh, all of it, and you will read the bold text with me. Um, I'll, I'll uh, kind of take us a, a slower cadence, and you can try to match me, but don't worry if you don't, because, uh, you know, we're on Zoom, and that's pushed to Facebook, and it's all delayed, and it all gets off anyway. So uh, I'll ask you, though, to join me, though, now as we read this uh, litany written for us uh, as per usual by Reverend Fran Pratt. Um, God, awaken our spiritual ears to learn as people, as people who are good at being taught, as people who are comfortable with admitting when we're wrong, as people, as people who can run from our own biases. biases, as people capable of sitting in <laughs> paradox, as people, people who understand the We know this world is full of dualities and absolutes, of people who want us to fit into one category or another of fights and judgments over this or that issue, of projections It's often hard to know what to think or how to be. Many days we find ourselves and our understandings. We set our inner, inner tables to welcome the wisdom of God, which offers rest and abundance, gentle discipline and thoughtful correction, which orders, which orders all things well. We set our attention, intention to befriend wisdom, to respond to her her and, and heed her counsel so that we may we live, live at ease without dread. Of Help us to lay down all our expectations and assumptions, every should, should not not do. every malformed opinion and preconceived notion. Every in favor of attending to wisdom's generous call and listening, listening deeply, deeply to divine, divine, divine voice. voice. May wisdom make her home with us and find us willing partners for her, her work. Amen. Okay. Thank you, David and Forrest and Tiffany for helping us this morning. Now I'm excited for us to enter into this little space called A Deeper Look. Let me just fix the screen to where I'm not confused right now. I'm gonna pin Jet Anderson. So excited to get to know you today. Uh, let's start with this. Introduce yourself. Just tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jet Redman Anderson, uh, as it is on Facebook, uh, because that is pretty much the, like, at least from the beginning of uh, 2021, how I've come to interact with this community, except for going to book clubs and stuff, which have been super uh, awesome to participate in. Uh, my pronouns are uh, he, him, his. And I guess a little bit about me, uh, when you asked me this question, Aurelia, when I was thinking about it, um, the pandemic kind of like wrecked parts of my whole personality, I guess. Like the things that I did, I was like super involved in church. I was super involved in the gym and I was super involved at work. And a lot of, pretty much every one of those things changed uh, during the pandemic. So I guess uh, some of the big things during the pandemic, more about me 
uh, as I got recently married uh, in December of 2020. So that's awesome. My wife, Sean, may be in the comments somewhere. Um, uh, so say hi to her as well. Uh, so yeah, that's been awesome. We met at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, married in December. So that's pretty much been like my recent life has been fam family stuff, uh, hanging out with my in-laws who are also in Austin uh, and really getting to know them and getting to know my wife uh, as well. So that's been super cool. Um, things that I'm like interested in, I guess I'm a, a software engineer here in Austin. You can probably throw a rocket in Austin and hit someone of those, uh, one of those software engineers. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I love technology, all things like, uh, I'm super obsessed with like Bo Burnham's inside, like everything technology, like internet related content stuff. Like I, I love that kind of stuff. Uh, super nerdy as well. Like I love, uh, video games. I have a like super awesome painting of like a PlayStation five, uh, PlayStation four video game behind me, uh, called Horizon Zero Dawn, which is awesome. Uh, I played D and I'm actually in a, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, podcast. Uh, where we like actually play through the game and like put it out for people to like judge us and like listen to our stories and stuff. So that's uh, a big part. But of course, the pandemic has changed that as well. So now we're all remote. Um, I love reading. I took my Kindle to, I went on a honeymoon to Hawaii with my wife recently and I started reading a bunch of, bunch of books. So that's been awesome as well. And last, I'm super into like sports and stuff. Uh, I love to work out and also I'm from San Antonio. So like this team we had is the San Antonio Spurs basketball. Basketball is my favorite sport. So if anybody loves watching basketball or the Spurs in general, I will like, if we have watch parties, I will be there. I'm kind of new to this, but uh, would love to dive into that. <laughs> Awesome. Wow. Thanks for sharing so much. I, there's going to be like a bunch of comments about, about so many of the things you just said. Jana, in particular, before you even said that, said, go Spurs, go. So, oh, you can show Jana your mug in case she missed it. Oh, everyone, yes. I'm also, see the mug. yep. I'm a Ravenclaw. I got this at Universal Studios. Yeah. Harry Potter. He, he even painted his wall to match uh, Ravenclaw colors. <laughs> I'm sure that's totally related. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Now that you've told us a little bit about yourself, let's go even deeper. What are some quirks uh, about you? Some things that no one would know unless you told them. Yeah. So I actually asked my wife this question. Like these are basically her answers uh, from, but uh, I love getting, uh, I've discovered recently uh, many, many petties with uh, Sean. That's how I kind of like express myself, like my nails kind of breaking down, you know, traditional like masculinity, et cetera, that I've been grown up in so like I have silver right now I've had purple in the past but uh they match my toes too but uh that's like kind of one of the things how I express myself now uh parts of my personality uh but also uh because you can probably see that you probably can't see uh, a deeper quirk is that I have a super a phobia of bees and like flying things uh stems it's like a subconscious thing like I get that bees are like you know super useful to the environment like ecological collapse we don't want that uh but if they're like anywhere near me uh I freak out a little bit it takes like every ounce of willpower that I have to like try and stay under control like we've gone to the farmer's market before uh and a bee was just like around this mead, mead stand like at the lake line farmer's market uh and I had to like really like center and like deep in like get within myself in order to like p pass over my credit card to like buy this bottle of mead <laughs> so uh yeah so if there's like flying things etc i tend to freak out but i'm trying i'm trying to get better that because sean my wife uh, she loves bees so that's a little uh <laughs> ironic wow that's so cool thanks for sharing both of those things that i mean i just think that's awesome just expressing yourself however you want no matter what society told us yes. was right or wrong and then of course the bees thing like how do you do you eat outside at restaurants because that's what i always <laughs> encounter bees is like eating lunch outside <laughs> yeah i i tend not to, i love eating inside uh for that <laughs> for that reason um I was always an inside person as a kid because technology and like video games and all that stuff so but uh I also like working out so it's kind of hard because it's like outside like nature great but also bees things that hurt you so <laughs> it's a balance that's funny thanks for sharing um it's good to know it's good to know we will be if we're ever outside hanging out which will happen a lot now yep. um we will be supportive of your phobia and mindful of it Okay. We're okay. working on it. So. so bonus question. You didn't know what this was going to be. Here it is. Mm -hmm. What? Wait, hold on. Let me make sure I say it right. What's your favorite self-care practice? 
self-care practice. That's fun. Pandemic. Yep. Uh, so yeah, so probably self-care is like I mentioned, uh, I, I like to work out a lot when I was like before the pandemic, I was probably working out and when I was single, like four to five times a week, uh, like lifting heavy weights, running, etc. But now when I get, when I get to do that, cause obviously it's COVID and stuff. So I don't get to go as much, just got married. Don't get to go as much. But when I do, I really love working out like the rush of endorphins, the, uh, just kind of being in my element as kind of a, a bigger, uh, person, and kind of throwing around strong stuff and kind of feeling good about myself uh, there is probably one of the best like self-care practices I can get. Like if any, if ever I'm feeling down, like I'll just be like, okay, I need to go to Gold's. I need to like work, work this out quite literally. <laughs> totally. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Last question. What is, what are you particularly passionate about right now in your spiritual life? Yeah, this this is an interesting question when you when you sent it to me. Like like I said, uh, Sean and I are pretty new uh, to to peace. Uh, we were involved in a, a church called uh, uh, evangelical church for the like the past three years or so. At, at least I was before I met my wife. Uh, and a lot of things I, I read recently uh, a book on politics and like one of the quotes is from Karl Barth and I I really loved it. He said that if you you know hear the creator, how, how can you ignore the groaning, the, the cries of creation? And like, so that really resonated with me. And I thought about one step further, like if you love, like not if any of you hear, like if you love the creator, how can you not like listen and like groan for the creation? So a big thing that I'm excited about is bringing my head and my heart more into alignment. Uh, not that it was like super out of alignment necessarily on a lot of things at, at that particular church but uh, bringing it more into like reading about, you know, the LGBTQ plus like in the church, um, pol politics, like economic, like ecological collapse, like socioeconomic, like racial inequalities, like all that kind of stuff. Just, it's a lot to, you know, feel down about, like as uh, the inside, if you've seen that special, like it's, it's a lot to deal with. Um, but yeah, kind of bringing my head and my heart more into alignment with that and like really looking forward to like diving in with this particular community. I've been reading lots of books like renew, like basically these books on LGBTQ stuff and politics and like all that. When I uh, like read the Bible now, I read it with more like aware like context, like broader context. So that like kind of informs like that special revelation of the Bible that, he's, that uh, God's given to us. Uh, I take it with a broader context. And then I also take that back kind of like what you were talking about for us, like people as books of God, like that general revelation, like seeing people for who they are, like Imago Dei, like image bearers, like every single one of them. So that's something that I'm super excited because that's always something that my heart has believed in, but not necessarily in my head. And now I'm much more excited to bring that into alignment. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I know a lot of people will really resonate and excited to hear what books you're reading and um, learn from you and with you in the days to come. So thank you. That's Jet. Yay. Send some love in the comments and we're going to move on, but thank you so much. All right. Hey, I'm Peyton Dawes and I've got a reading from Isaiah. We've got Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. God wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. God who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. We hear the voice of God through these words. Thanks be to God.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Hineke, and I have a reading from Psalm 19. The heavens herald your glory, O God, and the skies display your handiwork. Day after day, they tell their story, and night after night, they reveal the depth of their understanding. Without speech, without words, without even an audible voice, their cry echoes through all the world, and their message reaches the ends of the earth. For in the heavens, the sun has pitched a tent. It comes forth with the grandeur of a wedding procession, with the eagerness of an athlete ready to race. It rises at one end of the sky and travels to the other end, and nothing escapes its warmth. Your law, Yahweh, is perfect. It refreshes the soul. Your rule is to be trusted. It gives wisdom to the naive. Your purposes, O oh God, are right. They gladden the heart. Your command is clear. It gives light to the eyes. Holding you in awe of Yahweh is purifying. It endures. Your decrees are steadfast and all of them just. They are more precious than gold, than the purest of gold, and sweeter than honey, than honey fresh from the comb. And them your faithful people find instruction. There is great reward in keeping them. But who can detect one's own failings? Forgive the misdeeds I don't even know about. Keep your faithful one from presumption as well, so that my faults never control me then I will be blameless and innocent of grave error. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. We hear the voice of God through these words. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you for those readings. Thank you for everyone who's contributed this morning. Tracy, what? Um, what translation was that? Inclusive Bible. Yeah, love it. Okay. Well, I'm super happy to be uh, preaching this morning. It's been a minute. Our family moved. I have new digs, uh, but I have my same squeaky office chair. So <laughs> some things never change. Um, let me pull my sermon up and let's jump in. So I don't know why, but it seems that I always get assigned the weeks that we're kicking off some new sermon series. I don't know why. I just, I often seem to be the person who has the opening run, which is fun. I'm not complaining, but here we are. This is our new fall kickoff sermon series. We're calling it the post church church. Dun, dun, dun. What does that even mean? You might be asking, well, we invite you to stick around over the next few weeks because we're going to be exploring some ideas around who and what we are becoming as a community, what our goals and values are, and how we are imagining the idea of church, which is a pretty old idea with the checkered history, some good influences and some bad, some good outcomes and some bad ones, into a new era. And we are acknowledging as fearlessly as we can that we're in a church, post-church era. The sway that religion and church once had over people's lives and behaviors has diminished significantly in the last 50 years. And the old way of doing and thinking about things, those ways just don't necessarily work anymore. So we must shift our paradigms. And we're asking, what should we keep that is life-giving and bright? And what should we let go of that is harmful and outdated? We must embrace the new while still remaining tethered to an ancient spiritual tradition in ways that bring us life and joy and peace and that bring heaven to earth. So we're trying to work with what is rather than trying to pretend that it isn't. Yes? So today... <clears throat> I want to explore this with y'all specifically in reference to the concept of worship. Worship. And I, I, I want you to know that I'm assuming a posture of a fellow sojourner. Like I'm not trying to be some authority. I'm not trying to tell you what to think, 
But I am simply sharing with you where I have landed on this stuff as of now, knowing that I'm always in evolution, I'm always changing too. And I'm a person who spent the last 18 years of my life thinking about and talking about and reading about and leading worship. And then towards the end of my talk, because so, much, so many of us associate the word worship with music and singing, I want to tell you why I think it still makes sense for us to sing together in the post-church church. So stick around for that. But if you've been around for a while, you may have heard me say before that I'm kind of over the word worship. I don't really like it anymore. I would be done with it altogether were it not for a long line of spiritual tradition that affirms that, that word. And I would really, really like to reclaim a definition of it that is relevant and resonant for us actual humans in the here and now. But in general, it's a word that I tend to avoid because it doesn't really say what I mean. And it's really hard for me to avoid it because it's everywhere I turn as a pastor, pastor of worship and liturgy. So lately, which by which I mean like in the last 50 years or so, worship has become kind of a congregational catch-all word that means the service we produce or the gathering we facilitate, which I'm sorry, I just think that's kind of etymologically lazy and it bothers me because I'm very particular about clear language. Oh, and if it doesn't mean that, else it means, and I fully admit that this is reductive, okay? It means sort of, this adoration from afar of this supreme being who is detached from us and separate from us and out there. Like God is out there and there's this pervasive idea in mainstream faith and church, like um, which you may guess that I'm pushing back on pretty hard. That is that God is this egotistical glory hungry deity that needs or worse requires us to give him, and I say him because that God is a dude, adoration, verbal praise, jumping through various hoops. We're supposed to worship him um, for the purpose of either A, God being reassured of, reassured of God's goodness, because I don't know, maybe God's insecure, or B, us being reminded of our inferiority to God. I'm never kind of, I'm never quite sure which it is. And I really push back on that. Okay. I really, I'm totally out about the fact that I push back on that. And look, probably a lot of church people would say I'm a heretic, but those are just not theological that ideas that resonate for me as truth anymore. At this point in my journey, as I've come to understand and experience the divine in recent years, I just don't buy that line of thought anymore. That was taught to me right now. I'm more convinced than ever of the divine's indwelling presence within us, around us, near to us. And I'm more convinced than ever of that thing that Jesus says over and over in the scriptures, the kingdom of God is near. It's right here. The kingdom of God is within. It's within you and you and you. That's Luke 17. The community of heaven is waiting right here for us to become aware of it and align ourselves with it. The wheels of eternity are spinning and accessing that reality is a simple matter of directing our awareness, most often directing it to the quote, interior castle. As Teresa, as Teresa of Avila calls it, or to the heart, as so much of scripture refers to it. So all that said, you know, all of my little like sarcasm aside, I stand in great appreciation of the tradition of the Psalms. The Psalms were for centuries, the prayer book that is the main liturgical guide of the global church. And in many ways, they still are. We heard our Psalm for today that Tracy read, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge and so on. They're words to the end of the world. And other Psalms, if you study them, exhort the listener to sing, make melody, Worship God with gladness, exalt, exalt the Lord, and so forth. So there's this very beautiful and ancient tradition within Christianity 
of reverence from, for the divine and of living in a posture of attention and attentiveness to the divine and of beholding creation and express, expressing appreciation for it. So the Psalms give us this idea upon which I would say most of the modern worship industry has been built of praising God, glorifying God, which I think has turned into something interesting. And I'm not so much here today to critique that thing that it has turned into, okay? Like in some context, it's the emotional music and the dimmed lights and the smoke machines and the experiences uh, that are produced. Or in other contexts, it's you know, the booming organ and the choir and the gilded accoutrement that we produce and then we call it worship. But I'm not much here to, I'm not here to critique that so much as I am here to just share with you that over the course of 18 years, I've come to a new understanding and I discern a different set of needs for us in the post-church church. I say that humbly. I say that as a person who's just experiencing life. Like I could be wrong about some things and right about others. I'm not condemning any church practice, but I am questioning really deeply what is needed for moving forward. So the most profound shift for me has been in how I define worship. It is my current best thought over the last few years that worship distilled down to its essence is very simply attention. Okay, attention is, as Simone Weil wrote, the rarest and purest form of generosity. And Mary Oliver wrote, which I, I included it in the guide at the top, uh, attention is the beginning of devotion. Attention being the roots of our devotion or of our worship. So I really hope this idea helps you. I hope it helps you and I hope it lets you off whatever hooks you might have been on if you had a churchy upbringing that told you that you had to jump through a bunch of certain specific hoops and check a lot of certain specific boxes to show that you're worshiping God. Because I know that a lot of us here have come from a more traditional or we've come from more evangelical spaces. And if you're like me, you might be questioning that worship culture and wondering what to do with it now. Like what, how, what, how does it apply to me now? But here it is. I think that worship in its tiniest, most essential pixels is attention. I hope that, hears, that helps you to hear. Our worship or our attention is always going somewhere. It's always pointed in some direction. And I think that's actually... Um, it, it's actually our most important resource as humans. Like where is our attention directed towards whom or towards what issues or what beauty? And I am absolutely concerned both as a pastor in a spiritual com community and just as a regular spiritual and kind of contemplative person with where we are directing our attention. And I see the psalmic tradition as sort of a record and guide for a spiritual community trying to direct its collective attention toward the divine. So in a post-church world, one in which I personally no longer perceive God or the divine as this heavenly out there personality who's hungry for glory, but rather a force I'm learning to understand as being both near to me and inside myself and inside of other people. So a post-church world in which I no longer conceive of the kingdom of God as some afterlife destination, but rather an attainable, sustainable reality in the here and now. I'm free to understand the concept of worship differently. Instead of perceiving worship as like a production that we create for God's benefit, I'm thinking of it more as a moment by moment practice of directing my attention toward the divine as I encounter it both in the world and within myself. So to get into, I guess, the mechanics of this, 
I want to share with you a few other key concepts besides attention being the main one that I'm mindful of. And they are reverence, justice, and liturgy. Okay, the first is reverence. I want to read to you a little bit of what John, o John O'Donohue writes about reverence in this book, Beauty, Rediscovering the True Sources of Compassion, Serenity, and Hope, that I've been meditating on in the mornings here lately. Listen, <clears throat> in order to become attentive to beauty, we need to re rediscover the art of reverence. Ultimately, reverence is respect before mystery. But it is more than an attitude of mind. Reverence is also physical, a dignified attention of body showing that sacred is already here. Reverence is not to be reduced to a social posture. Reverence bestows dignity, and it is only in the light of dignity that the beauty and the mystery of a person, a book of God, as Forrest, my, as Forrest said, will become visible. Reverence is not the stiff, pious posture which remains frozen and lacks humor and play. To live with a sense of reverence is not to become a prisoner of dull piety, Playfulness, humor, and even a sense of the anarchic are companions of reverence because they insist on the proper proportion of the human presence in light of the eternal. Reverence is also the companion of humility. A sense of reverence includes the recognition that one is always in the presence of the sacred. To live with reverence is to live without judgment, prejudice, and the saturation of consumerism. The consumerist heart becomes empty and lonesome because it has squandered reverence. That kind of gave me shivers. Um, I, so he's connecting the art of reverence with like everything we want to be in life, right? It's kind of remarkable. It feels like maybe reverence is another one of those cheat codes for life that we sometimes joke about around here. Oh, we found another cheat code reverence, maybe a, a reverent posture. So as our worship, I think we're invited to assume a posture of reverence toward all the divine sparks we see in the world, all the evidence of coherent creation that we encounter, all the complex life forms, moment by moment, day by day, as a spiritual practice, maintaining reverence. We practice this attentiveness to what is, to beauty wherever we found it, because we know that all beauty is evidence of the divine, right? You knew that? Not like surface level beauty culture beauty. I mean, life force, nitty gritty, imago dei, God in everything kind of beauty. Okay, reverence. The next kind of buzzword that I'm, I'm throwing around here is justice. Okay, I'm calling it a buzzword, but that's not really what I mean. Uh, a defining concept, okay? Okay, here's what Sandra Maria Van Opstel says. She defines justice as the reordering of creation back to God's original intent, where we were made and created to stand together in solidarity and mutuality as one humanity. Okay, I think that part of our worship is working in partnership with the divine to achieve justice on earth. Okay, true justice that lifts the lowly, that enacts grace, mercy, and righteousness in the world, that ceases oppression, that provides for the orphan, the widow, the sick, the unjustly imprisoned, that seeks to root out unjust systems. And if our so-called worship, our attentiveness to God is not causing us to awaken to God inside ourselves so that we begin to do what God does in the world, then it isn't worship. What's the character of God? What's the character of God? The Psalms say that God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. God protects the simple and feeble, uplifts the lowly, extends compassion to the forgotten. And as we pay attention, more and more attention to God, both within ourselves and outside ourselves, we gradually, naturally, 
take on more and more of that work of bringing justice to earth, of reordering creation back to God's original intent of oneness. It's because of our worship that we attend to social justice, to working to eradicate racial inequality, to smashing the patriarchy, to abolishing the prison industrial complex, to providing for the poor, to caring for the grieving, and so on and so on and so on. Yeah, so Jesus Jesus didn't say much about worship when he walked on this earth. He did say, and he said it to the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And here's what I take that to mean. True worshipers will worship with our attention and our action, with our devotion and our justice making. And we do this because we've awakened to the Imago Dei, to ours and other people's Imago Dei. We are created in the image of God and beings who are created in the image of God can't help but work toward justice on the earth. Okay, justice. Last one, liturgy. Okay, the point of liturgy by which I'm specifically referring here right now to the songs and prayers and rituals and practices that we cultivate together in our communal gatherings. Okay, the point of all that is in my opinion to assist us in remembering our Imago Dei. Liturgy serves as a reminder to us of who we truly are and What's the bigger story we are part of? The bigger story of what divine love is accomplishing in the world and has accomplished in us as part of the world. Okay, it's why our liturgy is so important around here and we put so much time and energy and effort into it because it's like food. You are what you eat. Well, you are the liturgy that you practice on a daily basis. So we pay attention to liturgy in a very deep way. And I said earlier that I wanted to mention songs and singing. Um, my first year on staff here, I, re I preached a sermon that explained why I think singing matters. And I just wanna quickly recap some of those ideas, but I did include a link to that uh, sermon in the guide there at the bottom. Um, under this heading of liturgy. Okay, songs are liturgy. They're here to remind us of our true selves and our part in the big story. Every human culture on the planet has some tradition of singing or chanting, okay? Singing is innate to human beings. I really go into this in that other sermon. I'm not gonna preach that sermon again. You can go listen to it. Scientists now know that singing is actually a powerful vagal nerve stimulator, which means it activates our parasympathetic nervous system, which calms and soothes us and helps us recover from stress. We also know that music accesses the human memory systems in a way that's different from just words with no music. Like songs we memorize have a particular staying power in our memory in our memories. So by singing our liturgy, we remember it better. That's why you can still remember the lyrics to songs you knew in high school, or you can remember TV ad jingles. But what are we trying to remember here? Again, we're trying to remember our true selves in the image of God and the bigger story of God's and our work in the world. We also now have science that demonstrate that, demonstrates that human beings bond powerfully by doing a rhythmic motion together. It's called self-other merging as a consequence of interpersonal synchrony. There are scientific and biological reasons that human beings experience profound, a profound sense of connection one, with one another when we do rhythmic noise making together, i.e. making music. Not to mention, we know that this interpersonal synchrony activates our endorphin cascades, our happy, happy hormone chemicals in our bodies. And that makes us feel good. For me, that alone is reason for us to prioritize communal music. It's interactive art, but it's also connection and belonging. And it's us learning in a very real, real way, in a tangible way to live in harmony with one another. 
So that said, just to kind of let you in on my brain, how my brain works, um, there are three song, kinds of songs that we sing at peace. First is songs that tell the big story of God's love and character in community. Um, examples are the Canticle of the Turning or Your Peace Will Make Us One. Second kind, songs that are prayers, that are actually communications between us and the divine. And the third, the third kind of songs that I typically include in our repertoire are songs that express a particular emotion or posture, such as lament or grief or joy or gratitude. And I choose our songs very intentionally because if it's going to be a liturgy that we're getting into our brains, it better be good. It better be good and right and true, and it better matter. Because if our liturgy isn't fostering and reinforcing our justice work, then what's it here for? What is it doing? So, so if you ever think that I'm being really gatekeepy about the songs that we sing, you're right. It's because I am. Because I want us singing the good stuff in our community. Because I know the power of it. So I'm getting done. What are we actually doing here? Okay, what's the point of any of this? Okay, for me, even in the post-church world, sacred community and spiritual support are still important. Building a network of folks who are trying to do this thing in the midst of modern life, trying to be attentive and reverent to the divine in the world, trying to encourage one another in a life of doing the work of bringing the way of love, bringing the community of heaven to earth in the here and now. And it's hard, it's hard work. It's hard to maintain any sort of spiritual awareness, especially on our own. Like at any moment, we might get swept up in that consumerism that John O'Donohue mentions. We might get swept up in complacency and apathy or in the 24 hour news cycle or in addiction or obsession. And we might completely lose any sense of the bigger story of why we're here and what's our work and who are we really? So the work that we're doing here at Peace, which is tricky, against the grain sort of work, is we're trying to keep ourselves awake to that bigger story and to our role in the grand scheme of things, to mystery, to capital L love, and to our true selves. We're trying to be a community of people who can stay awake long enough amidst a tide of things that would distract us and put us to sleep long enough to be the peace of Christ on earth. It is a very grand goal, but we're committed to it. And it's the point of our worship, by which I mean our attention, our reverence, our justice, and our liturgy. And we recognize that need in each other to inspire and encourage one another, to remind each other of our truth and to help us up when these tidal waves of overwhelm knock us down as they're doing all the stinking time, you guys. That's what we're doing. And I would argue that that work of staying awake, of remembering, of attention, that's our worship. And any gathering or service we ever create in person or on Facebook or Zoom, any space we ever manage is always in service of that larger work. The liturgy we use or create serves to remind us of the bigger story and of the character of God that is resonant with our true selves. The songs we sing tell the bigger story. The rituals we do embody the bigger story. The community engagement that we do is in service of that bigger story of heaven on earth. And the sacred community that we build here among ourselves is in service of this bigger story, this wider reality of the way of love that we perceive Christ as having embodied on this earth and which we now seek also to embody. All right. Amen. I'm going to turn it over now to the Reverend Jonathan 
who has kindly agreed to sing us an original song. I'm very grateful. I think you're in for a treat. Thank you, Fran, for that wonderful message. I've looked for you on the mountain And there was no burning push I've looked for you in the desert And there was no pillar of fire I've looked for you whole world over and I'm starting to find you're here right now you're closer than the air I'm breathing in my
Wow. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing that with us. And thank you, everyone who's contributed to the service this morning. Let me lead us in our benediction. You know it well. I'll read the italicized portion and we can all join in together with the bold. Lord, you are ascending God. You sent your word to create. You sent Christ to reveal. You sent your spirit to empower. You sent your church to proclaim. Send us, O oh God, to renew the earth. Lead us by your spirit and your word. As your people, we now go. By our love, we'll make you known. People of God, you are sent. Go in peace for peace. Amen. 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 Bye, everyone.